Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion about artificial intelligence titled Facing the Big Questions of People, Trust, and AI. Uh, in a moment, I will have uh, my three esteemed guests introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Edward Adams. I am your host for this panel. Uh, I am the president and CEO of Security Innovation, a cybersecurity company focused on software. And as we will discuss in the next 45 minutes, software and technology play obviously a pivotal role in artificial intelligence. So with that, allow me to please introduce my three panelists. And I'd like to start, uh, Osama, with you, please. Introduce yourself and a brief, uh, brief bio about yourself. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Osama Fayyad. I am uh, the executive director at uh, the Institute for Experiential AI at Northeastern University, where I'm also a professor uh, in the Computer Sciences College. And uh, I also am chairman of uh, Open Insights, uh, a company I started in 2008 uh, that basically works on uh, AI, big data, uh, data valuation, data assessments, um, and has worked with many of the Fortune 1000 companies uh, around the world. Um, background has been in AI for a long, long time, uh, starting with uh, uh, NASA JPL, actually, in, in Bill's uh, neighborhood, uh, moved to Microsoft uh, up in the uh, Seattle area, uh, then uh, did two startups after Microsoft, the second of which got acquired by Yahoo, which is where I had the pleasure of meeting and working with Ricardo uh, uh, when I when I uh, helped start Yahoo Research and kind of was the responsible EVP for research in addition to being the first chief data officer. Um, then uh, right after Yahoo started Open Insights, uh, took a break for three years to be the global chief data officer at Barclays Bank in, in London and New York. Uh, then came back to the Bay Area in 2016 uh, where I uh, was at Open Insights uh, full time until uh, taking on the position with uh, with the Northeastern University. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Uh, quite uh, quite a heralded career. Uh, let me transition to uh, to Bill Bellows, uh, please. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, a little bit different than uh, Usama. Um, I have a PhD in aerothermodynamics. Worked in the jet engine business in Connecticut for seven years, and there got exposed to the work of uh, Junichi Taguchi and his ideas on uh, what do you call it, robust design. I was then hired by Rocketdyne in Los Angeles in 1990 as the internal expert for his work. I then began to slowly shift my focus from uh, technical aspects of Taguchi's work to the work of uh, W. Edwards Deming, who I met in 1990, 1993, and I started focusing on more of this aspect of trust and um, how organizations work together and learn together. And, and my belief is we, we can't work and learn together unless we understand what the word together means and that it's really about relationships. And that's what gets us into trust. And what I find is um, organizations are predominantly based on silos. Organizations create silos. Um, each, each department of an organization, engineer, engineering, manufacturing, they're all based on creating silos. And so my work with my clients, I've, I've left Rocketdyne. I work for the W. Edwards Deming Institute, nonprofit promoting Taguchi's work, or Dr. Deming's work. Mm -hmm. I now have my own consulting company with a couple of cool clients and teach online courses in these ideas, which are, as I shared with you earlier, Ed, were fundamentally about they're fundamentally about trust, and and are we are and the other thing I want to point out is uh, what intrigued me by this title is the, is this focus on efficiencies, and that's what I find organizations are technologies are all about efficiency, which is doing things faster, doing things cheaper, replacing people. Nothing wrong with that, but what I learned from a, a mentor Russ Akoff is that. We treat organizations, individuals, we treat efficiency and effectiveness as kind of the same term. 
And I never dawned I was doing that. And what Russ would say, efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things right. <laughs> and what Russ would argue is if you don't focus on effectiveness, you end up doing the wrong thing right. And, it, and I'll just leave it with um, the, wronger, the righter you do the wrong thing, the wronger you become. And so that intrigued me on this focus on, on trust. I think there's a lot we do in organizations which are destroying trust. Absolutely, for sure. Thanks, All man. right. Uh, with that, allow me to please transition to our last, uh, our last guest, uh, Professor Ricardo. Thank you, Ed. So uh, I got my PhD in computer science at the University of Waterloo in Canada a long time ago. I was mainly in uh, searching algorithms. Uh, and I was working in academia in, in Chile and Spain uh, for several years. I, I wrote the most used textbook on search by now. And then I moved to Yahoo Labs, where I had the pleasure to work with Usama, Andrew Usama. So uh, I was there 10 years. I was the VP of research. Uh, then when Yahoo was sold, I moved to, to be CTO of a semantic search company. And then I joined uh, the last, uh, say, one and a half years, Northeastern University in this new Institute of Experiential AI, where the, I'm the director of research. And one of the main areas of that, that research is responsible AI. Excellent, excellent. So as uh, all of you can hear that are tuning in, whether uh, live or recorded, there is a lot of brain power sitting on this panel right here that have researched things like trust in artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, and, and Professor, uh, let me start with you. Oh, sorry, Ricardo. Uh, got yes, multiple Ricardo. professors on this panel. <laughs> uh, Ricardo, allow me to start with you, please, with a very fundamental question. Can AI be trusted? Yeah, so, so here I'm sure I, 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 maybe there will be some disagreement mm -hmm. in the panel. Uh, but but uh, let me start with the semantic part. So, so trust is a human uh, characteristic. So we trust humans. So it's not about trusting anything mm -hmm. else. So we don't trust animals or plants. Really, it's about humans. So, so the first thing is that we have this uh, anthropomorphic tendency of uh, applying the same human things to, to machines, for example. And that's the first problem. But let's say that we follow this trend and we say, OK, uh, machines can be trusted. And then the, and my answer today, maybe in the future, is different. The answer is no, uh, because basically they don't work all the time. So we know that, uh, for example, typically they, they ask, OK, accuracy is 90 percent, accuracy is 95 percent. So there is a certain percentage of the time that the, the system doesn't work. And I can trust an elevator. If they, but if they tell me that it works 99% of the time, I would never go in the elevator. So, so it's the same way we do with, uh, for example, with drugs. Uh, they don't say they, they work 100% of the time. When you go to the pharmacy, they tell you what are the side effects. And then you, you say the trade off. Okay, I can trust this because uh, the, I will not be die. I will not die from this. But in this case, we are using the, the success instead of using the failure, which is something. Mm -hmm that we need to change in the future. Know what is the, what is the failure? For example, if someone says the elevator works 99% of the time, but when it doesn't work, it always stops. Okay, that's more safer than, than, than for example, <laughs> going down the, the elevator ditch uh, and, and be killed. So this is why we cannot trust uh, technology today because it's not really uh, an engineering yet. It's not like uh, building a building or building a, a a car or building a, a bridge is uh, heuristics that works part of the time. So we shouldn't trust yet, yet AI. Got so, it. Sorry uh, about that. I had a quick uh, technical hiccup, but uh, but I'm back. Uh, Usama, please. I'm sure you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, if I if I may comment on this, look, I I, I agree fundamentally with with Ricardo when he says you know trust is a human notion. Uh, however, uh, the the issue is more relevant than I think Ricardo believes, which is, you know, we do have the notion of trusting machines and we do have the notions, and he used the example of an elevator or escalator or, you know, a lot of these things that we think of as low risk. Uh, but we also trust in systems. We trust in systems of government. We, we, we trust in uh, uh, policies. We trust in certain things where we decide, look, we can live with them and it's kind of the best option, right? Um, Sometimes it's about conventions and trusting that, okay, driving on the right-hand side of the road is, 
is a fine thing in the United States. But uh, Osama, that may be a first world bias because in developing countries, we don't trust many of the things you mentioned. Yeah, no, true. I mean, we, we do trust machines, right? <laughs> People trust trust their their weapons, their, you know, whatever it is, whatever is going on, their, their religion. So I don't want to get into it that way other than say the following. Uh, I agree that today, is AI technology ready for kind of uh, an easy uh, uh, approach to human trust? I would be the first to say no. And uh, we, you know, the error rate is too high. But today, think about it, you know, uh, 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 an automobile is pretty complex device with all sorts of, and nowadays, especially with all sorts of processes, with all sorts of you know, thinking and decision making with with uh, you know, engines or even you know controlling when, when the ignition is 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 uh, or or when the spark is delivered or or when the the you know cylinder for an internal combustion engine is 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 caused to kind of uh, ignite and go into the power cycle. They're now decided by a lot of processes. And what has happened over the time uh, is people, you know. I would argue not only trust their cars, they rely on them. They could, you know, lose their jobs and lose their living in many cases if their main vehicle of transport that they, you know, take and do jobs with fails. But today they trust it. They take it for granted. And despite all the complexity, thanks to a lot of the engineering work to uh, Ricardo's uh, point, you know, we have grown uh, to see enough evidence to trust. So number one is the notion of, Creating enough around the technology to get it to a point where it should be trusted by humans is doable. The fact that a technology is not ready today does not mean that we can't ever trust it because cars, you know, if you go back 100 years where, you know, you're lucky if you got it started once a day. And if you go back 50 years, you know, you had to have a, a garage and maybe a, a, a driver and definitely be a mechanic part time to make sure you can, you know, take a, a trip and survive it. So you know, it's evolved a long way to get to a point where you just get in and hit a button and sometimes not even hit a button and the thing starts going. So it's a, it's a, it's an evolution. So I yeah, think well, it is doable. It, well, now the question becomes, what are the principles and how do we think about it? And what does it uh, mean to do, to do trust? I think we, we agree completely. I said yet today we cannot trust it. Maybe yeah. in the future we can, but there, there's a difference that, that, that we have with between say cars and airplanes and, and, and AI today. Uh, if you go to the, say, the middle of the 20th century, no, no one would say we should have trustworthy airplanes. Today, we're, we're, it's people saying trustworthy AI. So that's the misleading part for me, that we are asking them to trust it before you can trust it. But so a lot of people draw a distinction, though, between technology and artificial intelligence. And a lot of folks can <laughs> trust, trust the technology in an automobile, but they might not necessarily test or trust what they perceive as artificial intelligence in an automobile, such as a self-driving car. So how do we, how should we be thinking about trustworthy technology versus artificial intelligence when it comes to things like responsibility, ethics, and accountability? A anyone, please. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first uh, stab here, although Ricardo from the ethics side is definitely a, a better expert than me. I, I would say I would say the following. There is definitely an extra challenge and an issue when it comes to AI, because when you say uh, this system has intelligence in it, you're implying that the system can make its own decision, can take you know control of the situation, may do something that you disagree with, right? And that, of course, creates a higher threshold for trusting than when you say this thing is a machine, effectively. In computer science language theory, it's an automaton, and therefore it's only going to do these things, and it's going to do these things reliably because it can't do anything different. So the 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 way to recover from that, and, and this is a challenge, right? There is the human side of, of trustworthiness that you have to kind of bridge. And a lot of you know, I'm not the expert here, there's been a lot of historical work on, you know, why do humans trust each other to begin with? And there's kind of you know a whole camp that says, well, there's similarity. You know, we're all biologically similar enough and we kind of assume that the other party has the same reasoning mechanism mm -hmm. and, and the same fears and the same uh, uh, reasons not to do something. Whereas with a machine, 
it's a it's a foreign entity and therefore we're challenged to even understand what it's doing um i don't think the problem is unsolvable i think it's it's a problem to be worked on and to be solved uh but i do think definitely having the hype hurts ai a lot and hurts society a lot you know a lot of people you know i think uh elon musk coming out and promising that in one year we're going to have fully autonomous cars does not help anyone because i i for one believe that techno- and, and i'm an ai expert the technology is just simply not there right and therefore uh now that doesn't mean that it will never be there i think we will get to a day where it might you know start driving safer and better than most humans but we're not there yet there's too many complex issues too many issues involving indirect things so even if we perfected driving under the conditions of the sensors people haven't modeled what happens when the sensors are not working right uh and when when there's a misalignment or something there's a lot of feedback loops and mechanisms say in humans and in animals where when your sensors are misaligned your brain forces you to like go down and not move right and that yeah. that comes from for good evolutionary reasons uh that we haven't reached that stage with with uh machines and that is the big uh 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 challenge ahead of us now in principle what what can we work on right what we can work on is definitely responsible ai so spell out you know what are the governance models what are the ethical issues how do you detect unfairness who do you hold accountable uh and we need to work on the technical aspects of trustworthiness like the machines demonstrate that they are accurate you know all of the time or most of the time that they have the right backup mechanisms and react correctly in uh Ricardo's example if there's a failure the elevator freezes it doesn't just drop off right uh you know the equivalent thing happening in uh high speed uh autonomous navigation we're far from having it happen but for example low speed vehicles whether they're in a factory in a constrained environment or on the streets like a garbage truck i can see uh autonomous navigation because that setting allows the vehicle to stop and wait and wait for intervention by humans which is so important right the reason we call it the institute for experiential ai it's about ai with the human in the loop making an intervention at the right moment in the right mode which is a hallmark today of machine learning that works correctly that can be guided by humans because data alone i would be the first to tell you after spending my entire life on machine learning data alone is not enough you need that exactly exactly every possibility right in in order to learn uh, there needs to be a teacher uh yes. and and that that's an important piece sorry so uh so so uh, mr bellos let me transition to you for a moment uh, so i i'm a mechanical engineer by trade okay, uh, so i keep a uh, keep a close eye on uh things uh you know what's known as industry 4.0 today you know like robotics and ai fueled manufacturing sector and it seems like you know, unlike autonomous vehicles uh there has been a tremendous amount of development there that has been trusted and continues to be trusted and i'm also a big fan of uh, of of dr deming and his principles of a quality efficiency and effectiveness so how in this world can those can these principles coexist as applied to today's you know, industry 4.0 that's being digital digitized well let me um <clears throat> I take a bunch of notes based on what Ricardo and Osama were just saying. Um so thanks for having me go next. Um I think in my work what I find is uh, um Osama said we have trust in systems and what is trust? Trust is confidence in an outcome. Right? So you know trust is I can get to work in 30 minutes, you know trust is when you said you're going to do it. And and now I may have trust that you're not going to be on time. So trust works trust is just confidence in an outcome. I may not like the outcome. Um and the work I was doing at Rocketdyne what I found was essential in in terms of the contract we were working on in the mid 90s for the Air Force and next generation launch vehicles. I did not believe the current system of principles could could deliver what the Air Force was looking for. I had no trust. And my challenge and colleagues was to get as many of them as possible to lose trust in the existing system and the strategy was to create transparency what are the fundamental principles of our system of operation you know going back to engineering what what is it and so i find it 
I think there's parallels for what you're doing in AI is let's make, let's create transparency on the fundamental principles. So when I met with a, the senior most NASA executive in terms of quality, and we had we done some amazing things at Rocketdyne, I was asked to go meet with him. I called him up a week in advance to make sure he knew I was coming. He says, what are we going to talk about? And, I, and he says, are we going to talk about Lean and Six Sigma and this stuff? I said, no, I want to look at, I want to go look at something really simple. I want to look at this theory of interchangeable parts. And he says, what do you mean? I said, you've heard of interchangeable parts? He said, yep. I said, so of all the parts that go into a NASA system, what is your letter grade requirement? What do you think is the letter grade requirement of every single part that goes into every single thing they buy? And he immediately says, A+. Plus. I said, A plus is not the requirement. He said, what's the requirement? I said, the requirement is passing. It has to meet requirements. So in the world of quality, the principles in terms of quality are it meets requirements or it doesn't. So I said, the letter grade requirement is actually D minus. Then I said, is a D minus the same as an A plus? He said, no. I said, that's why they're not interchangeable. <laughs> and so when you, so my strategy was, to get across to people that that transparency on that difference that we're allowing into our hardware from suppliers, A minuses and D pluses, we don't even know the letter grade because the quality system only knows passing. But what we found, Ed, prior to this meeting at NASA headquarters, when we paid attention to the letter grades and changed the principles from meeting requirements to looking finer as to what's the letter grade of how things we found it we found we can dramatically improve performance of the system and how things went together but the challenge was to get across to people that a black and white system would not allow us to do what we needed to do and i just use some everyday examples and show them when you're at the supermarket sorting through oranges you're taking into account that they're different and I try to tell them at work we pretend an orange is an orange. Right. So right. And all those there. oranges are had passed some quality control. Yes, they have passed. <laughs> well, if, if they're if they've passed, Ed, then why are you sorting through them? <laughs> what I was trying to show them is that why don't we sort through them at work? And so then what I was trying to do is show them that what you do at home is managing a system, and what we do at work is managing parts. So it goes back to what Osama was saying is it's it's challenging the principles. So my strategy was get them to lose confidence in the current system, lose trust, and gain trust in a system they already have, they already use. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah. it, it, that's a, it's a fascinating approach of getting – your objective was to try to break trust in, yes. in order to prove a point. A point. Yes. And then, and then show them. When you, when you sort through fruit, what are you doing? You're doing what I'd like you to do. So you have confidence in that system already. So can I extend uh, that on, on, on the ethical part? So, so just to paraphrase, because we're talking about artificial intelligence, Kate Crawford in her latest book, Atlas of AI, as she says, that it's not intelligent, it's not artificial. Uh, intelligent because uh, machines are very different to us, so they are much better in many things, but they're completely different. So they don't think like us. They don't think first. Uh, they are very fast. They they have a lot of memory. They have uh, very strong. They don't need to rest and so on. You see, these are the, the good things. So we should work together rather than try to say that we are competing. Uh, and it's and it's not in, in, uh, artificial because it, the, we are using a lot of natural resources. <laughs> to to run these things, so but I, I I would like to complement what Bill was saying because I think uh, transparency is a key thing. So for example, if you go to the ethics, there there are I think two 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 different uh, uh, branches that are very important. So one is uh, about equity and inclusion. So so one problem in the future maybe AI will increase the digital uh, the, the the digital gap and technology gap uh, among the people in the world. So so uh, many times the people with money. Uh, benefits from technology while, while the poor people suffers, suffers it. And I have plenty of examples of that. So equity and inclusion is something very important. And the second is, is transparency. And, and the first transparency is about awareness. Awareness, for example, about the limitations. For example, something that every day I find more important is uh, that data 
a knowledge basis, let's say you take the, the two different worlds like uh, pure machine learning and, and, and expert system, data and knowledge basis will never capture the context of any situation. So basically ma the machine will not know what a human person knows or a human person can feel. Of course, there is more. We also have that limitation. We cannot capture everything about the situation, but to have data knowledge basis, to have the same, let's say, uh, sensory of a situation, we are very far away. And, and, and that is, uh, I agree with Susama, that will not happen in one year for cars, will happen maybe longer, but who knows? But these are the, but aware of this limitation, I think is my first ethical thing. So, so not, 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 don't talk about singularity. Don't talk about super uh, robots. Uh, we are the masters. We have to, we have to be in control, not only in the. So, so why we are talking about uh, robot rights or other things that, that don't make any sense? We are the creators. So if we would like to play God, let's play God. So. I mean, quick, quick comments from my side. I, uh, I really like, uh, you know, Bill's, Bill's angle on this uh, in terms of kind of demonstrating the or establishing the, the distrust. But I think I, I am very, um, I think it's very useful to think about the principles that you need to, to follow, right? So uh, no one has a definition today of trustworthy. No one has a very solid, good definition of what is responsible AI. But what I can tell you is we believe there are certain principles that are very important, right? Uh, transparency, um, explainability. So when, when a system makes a decision and you're puzzled, you have a means of saying, well, okay, why did you reach this decision? Because that's also a, a means to, to, to take you towards establishing trust. Um, of course, on the technical side, reliability, uh, consistency, uh, predictability. Um, uh, so we have we have these principles, and and they exist in the literature. And and I'm happy to also kind of share some write-ups uh, around kind of the list of principles that are important for responsible AI, the list of the principles that are important for what is being called trustworthy AI, and and they all kind of make sense, right? You can't, and and they're all anti kind of black box even when you have to have a black box you have to have a way of explaining to someone why something happens it's important to get the technology adopted uh, and it's important to actually have the technology functional in a way that makes sense where people don't reject it or are unjustifiably afraid with it, uh, of it but to bill's point directly there are also certain principles that basically says we should be worried about certain things and we should not be trusting Right. And that's why to me, like the, the work on agreeing on what those principles are, uh, how do we kind of make these principles more commonplace? How do we link them to governance, policy and decision making? They're very, very important issues. Oh, I completely agree. Absolutely. Oh, so, uh, Ricardo, let me go back to you for, for this next question, because uh, for, for many of us, particularly uh, you know, lay people, Artificial intelligence can provide bots of a very scary dystopia, especially if you watch a lot of sci-fi movies like I do. Uh, you know, images of rogue robots that can control your lives uh, come to mind. So you know, what, what do you say to those of us that think that a artificial intelligence should only be used in conditions of extreme human control? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... Um, the problem with uh, that the ethics is always running behind technology. So, for example, uh, I would say if you want to be like, the, if you want to talk about dystopias, we uh, we agreed on not using uh, chemical weapons after the Germans use uh, gas in, in the First World War. Then we agreed not to use atomic bombs, although you never know, after the U.S. Uh, bombed Japan in the Second World War. Should we wait until we have like a military disaster uh, from military robots or we should agree before like in the united nations to to say uh, okay the next world will be fight in, in in a simulator where you will put the best programmers and the ones that win that those won the war and nobody will die uh, and this will be like a huge advance on 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 how how you run the uh, arguments between countries uh, this will be my my the best future for me and, and then the same, we have human rights and we need to extend them to all, all possible technologies. One problem with uh, time to regulating the use of AI is that 
We shouldn't regulate technologies like regulating hammers. Uh, you can use a hammer for a good reason, and you can also damage a person without uh, doing something bad. So we should regulate more like uh, economical sectors where we already have done that in, in health, uh, food, and other things. So why we don't extend that to cover all possible technologies in the near future? Because otherwise we'll see things like, uh, I imagine in the future, uh, regulation of uh, quantum computing. Uh, I hope they don't do one for blockchain because that will be too much, but the, the hype with blockchain is so large that, that maybe that happened. So, so, um, uh, so, so, regulate, so don't, re don't regulate the technology, but regulate the application of the technology. Exactly. exactly. And, and, and for any technology, don't, don't, don't use a specific technology. So we, we should, like human rights. Human rights, um, you don't say which technology can you do to basically don't, don't fulfill human rights. You say, don't do this. And people have to, to well, have to agree on that, right? So, so this is something that is important. And, and there are other problems with uh, the, the proposed regulation in the European Union, but but I think this is the main one that, that uh, if you ever start regulating hammers, every hammers, I don't think is the right way to go. Yeah, it's an interesting concept because you know there are rules and even just keeping with the consistent theme that we've been talking about, you know, self-driving cars, there are rules. So, you know, when you, when you ask a lay person, you know, should a car ever be allowed to you know, cross a double line in the middle of the street into you know, the other the traffic flowing the other direction? Most people would say, well, no, of course not. But what if the condition is to avoid a head-on collision that's most likely fatal? I mean, that's a condition that you might want to break the rule, break the rule technically. Uh, so it, it's, very, it's a very interesting balance uh, that, that I think it's, uh, it's challenging for us to, uh, to, to maintain as, as humans. I, I love the concept of, of regulate not the technology, but what you can do with the technology. Uh, Bill or Osama, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I mean, and we have we have great examples of, of that in 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 day to day life. I mean, uh, to me, the the most dangerous weapon that every adult in the world and sometimes even non adults have access to is is the automobile. Right? You can you can get in and cause tons of damage. However, society quickly evolved towards certain norms and certain policies that basically says, you know, you go through a licensing process. Uh, there are penalties and enforcement when you violate that process. Uh, you must follow the rules this way. There are severe penalties when you don't follow those rules. Uh, and we have learned how to live with probably the most, you know, dangerous, handy weapon uh, available out there, right? Uh, and uh, so I, I am I am bullish on on the notion of evolving the right kind of regulation and policies uh, that go around the use of a technology. And I'm glad, you know, no one wrote a law that said, well, the internal combustion engine shall not use any mechanism other than a spark plug meeting the following conditions. Otherwise, it's illegal. Then you know we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, also, exactly. also because, because so in this way, uh, also that the many people say that regulation kills innovation, which I think is a fallacy. But but I, I think that's more probable if you try to regulate the technology itself, especially f from people that don't know how the technology works. For example, there are things that can, you cannot enforce, but it's still are in, are in the regulation. Well, absolutely. And then to your point, this is why, you know, millions of dollars of cryptocurrency disappear on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, Bill, uh, let me go back to something that you mentioned early uh, in your introduction about efficiency versus effectiveness. Uh, and to me, artificial intelligence is, is very much about efficiencies, you know, automating things to do them faster and, and learning to get even faster. Um, however, history has shown us that effectiveness does not necessarily equate to I'm sorry, efficiency does not necessarily equate to effectiveness. So in keeping with the title of the session, in your opinion, you know, what's the risk that people trust artificial intelligence maybe just a little bit too much and lose sight of the effectiveness in light of the efficiency it brings? Well, and this is what I was just thinking, at least listening to the, the most recent remarks from Ricardo and Usama is that um, is is First of all, the understanding that efficiency and effectiveness are not the same. And when I heard Akoff say that, I thought, holy cow, I've been watching all these people use these terms as if they're all the same. 
And and when I when I learned from him that they're different, and and then I realized that, I mean, I'm I love tools and techniques, but tools and techniques are about efficiency. Um, I look at. Um, I was once asked by a, a, a customer of Boeing when Rocketdyne was owned by Boeing, what do I do? And I said, I go around and ask people, you know, I get seminars, ask people questions. What kind of questions do I ask in seminars? And I said to this guy, I said, what would it be like to work in an organization where everyone thought the last straw broke the camel's back? You know, everything was, you know, like the last shot wins the game. And he says, I wouldn't want to work in that environment. I said, why? He said, if I was the last straw, they'd all blame me. I said, what else? He said, the other straws were sitting there watching, thinking they had nothing to do with it. And so for several minutes, every time I answered, I said, what else, what else, what else? After five minutes, he was so exasperated. He said, that's our company. Well, the reason I, I share that briefly, Ed, is that environment uses technology to speak up blame. <laughs> it just, and, and it doesn't question. And, and so I think this whole thing of going back to a comment Ricardo made is human rights is about effectiveness. And I think the better we understand effectiveness, because that then guides the use. And and otherwise, what happens is we just increase the speed of blame. And so again, I'm not I'm not against technology, but uh, GM spent billions of dollars in the in the 80s trying to catch up with Toyota, and and Toyota could not have asked for a better competitor than one that would implode speeding up the wrong thing <laughs> exactly they got very efficient at doing the wrong thing <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. and this is why when i hear come this is what when i was within boeing is trying to warn people is yes we can increase you know, do things faster but let's not do the wrong thing better <laughs> let, let me let me add let me add two aspects to this discussion because i think i, I like always to have the big picture and and uh, and try to make people aware of all the angles so, so uh, related to what uh, Bill was saying, I think one very important uh, thing that we need to worry about, and I think COVID showed that, is resilience. Resilience is the opposite of efficiency in some sense. Resilience is to, to have, for example, fault tolerance, is to have uh, more than one way to do things. So basically we survive. And, and survival of, of any, any species, not only uh, humans, is about resilience, it's not about efficiency. So. So it, it's, it's about both, because basically, thanks to the efficiency of our body, basically, the, the brain started to think. So the brain was not made to think. The brain, if you read neuroscience, the brain was made to control our body. But we were so efficient in doing that, and then we had some free time to, to basically to think, and, and then the, the thing started to get to AI. Yeah? And the second, the second angle that I want to, to mention is that whenever we are talking about technology, we need to remember that one digital right that should be very important is the right to not be digital. So otherwise, we will leave people behind, like old people that don't want to learn the technology or people that believe in a poor country that, that they cannot use the technology and so on. So we need to have that in mind that that is it's not a first world thing, it's, it's the whole world thing. And, and then that's another ethical principle that for me is very important. It's again, it's again inclusion but detailed. <clears throat> yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and welcome back, Usama. Uh, so uh, apologies, I somehow Chrome dropped me and I had to restore it. <laughs> it's okay, it happened to me earlier and we are, as Ricardo was just talking about, we are resilient as human beings. We figure out how to survive. <laughs> yeah, we so, have four uh, people to, to have at least one in the screen. That's right. And, 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 <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, uh, Resilience is one of the principles of the requirements for, for uh, trustworthiness, meaning if the environment changes on you, you can actually adapt and start thriving right. under the new conditions. Uh, a very important one that both Ricardo and Bill mentioned is what we call kind of graceful degradation, right? When you don't just start spewing out garbage and then crash, <laughs> you actually recognize there's an issue and you shut down. Uh, in an orderly fashion, a lot of these things. Sorry, I had to. I had to inject it in when you mentioned resilience. No, no, no. I think it's great. I think failing safely is incredibly important, especially in artificial intelligence. Oh, yeah. um, now, 
But, and I'll stick with you, uh, Osama, for this one. Let's go in the other direction, though, because uh, I've read about artificial intelligence implementations where the machine to machine communications change themselves. They learn, and sometimes the very language in which they communicate for efficiency's sake, because the language they were programmed in is just too darn slow. So the system learns a faster way to communicate and learns, and in doing so, becomes unreadable to the humans that built them in the first place. So how realistic is this in a modern you know, AI powered system to the paranoid you know, AI no. dystopian like myself? No, I mean, I mean that, there, are, there, are inter, there, there are instances where systems are equipped with what is called domain specific language generation capabilities where they go there. But those are, those are far from being the big threat today. But I will tell you the equivalent threat, which is really related to kind of understandability and explainability of the AI yeah. is often, uh, you know, just, just as a statement I'll make, um, AI over the past 80 years and, you know, in my personal argument, over 100 years because it's been around before the 1956 workshop, um, we haven't seen too many advances either in the theory or the algorithms. But what has happened is we have lived in a world where the amount of data available about honestly anything has grown exponentially and super exponentially in some cases. Uh, coming, and especially now after digitization took off at an unprecedented rate uh, uh, post-COVID, uh, data is everywhere. So what has happened was people, of course, say, okay, I, I don't know how to solve the problem of making a machine understand language. I don't know how to solve the problem of making a machine understand an image. I don't know how to solve the problem of making the machine come up with an accurate prediction, but I have so much data that I can train this thing and allow it to build extremely complex data. And I'll, I'll use as, as an extreme complex is what we've been seeing recently with what's called deep learning, where it's not just any artificial neural network, but it's a neural network with many, 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 many more layers than ever before, with many, 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 many more input uh, attributes than ever before. Uh, those things become, and, and we, we start we start seeing them. They start performing well. You know, some of these things recognize speech. They are uncannily accurate at recognizing things like handwriting, faces, all of that stuff. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to ignore the fact that all of this comes with biases that come from what data you fed them and what decisions these algorithms decide to make because you can't show them every one of the, all the possible combinatorial uh, possibilities in the real world, uh, which is a huge issue. But that alone constitutes a language, if you will, of, of operating and communicating that is beyond the reach of the human mind, right? Trying to understand what the heck is going on inside this engine to cause this decision. And why did you decide that Ricardo is a bad guy and, and somehow Bill is a good guy, right? Based on an image or a sound or something. It's, it's, it's scary. <laughs> this is real stuff, right? This is happening in, in our daily lives and it's something we need to worry about. And it's directly to your question, uh, in fact, uh, because effectively uh, this is at, uh, the equivalent of your question, which is that machine is using a language which is beyond the reach from a capability, understandability, uh, or even reasoning of a human being. I'll use even simpler examples, mm -hmm. right? Something we all use day in, day out. And my favorite example these days is the Google search engine, which many people don't know is the largest scale machine learning implementation on the planet, right? They use something called MLR, which is <clears throat> effectively you take all the feedback from prior search queries and answers and, and, and attributes derived from content on the web. And you basically incorporate a lot of feedback from humans day in, day out, some through click through, some through direct editing, what's called editorial search. They have huge staffs whose job is to kind of say, no, 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 this result is irrelevant, even if people yeah. clicked on it. And this result is on page 100, it should be on page one, etc. That feedback or this meme means this thing that a machine can never figure out but a human, of course, can f feedback. That's how the engine, on a daily basis and sometimes hourly updates, right, through time and through iteration with the human in the loop, builds an algorithm that 
effectively becomes super efficient at finding yeah. the top few pages that you're looking for fairly quickly. Now, it feels like magic. It looks like magic. But it is iteration of a human in the loop generating data and giving the feedback. Now, here is a challenge that goes directly to your question. Even if you ask Google itself, what the heck is your engine doing? And how do you page around know. different pages? No one, no human being can tell you. Now, they can sit down and come up with a project and try to kind of project to different spaces and come up with explanations. But it is so complex, yet uh, to, to Bill's point, so efficient and accurate that you know, they're not going to mess with it. But guess what? When that engine arbitrarily decides, I'm going to start blocking queries of this sort or redirecting to that, they can kill whole swaths of the digital economy in one small change, and sometimes the offline right. economy, because That's suddenly right. people who relied on this for business and for getting clients, et cetera, are no longer findable, according to this engine. So we actually live at the economic mercy of that engine today. No one understands what it does. Right, uh, and and it's it's a it's a scary it's scary pro prospect, right? For it is affecting all the way from academicians who want their work found to uh, you know liberation movements to actual economic activities. And, exactly, and not, exactly. And, and also very important, no one knows, not even Google, if the ten first results are the ten best. They are good, but that's you right. don't know if they are the best. So that's so, right, and and, and that's you know, and I'm I'm still amazed that. I'll be talking with my wife about uh, about you know a piece of clothing in the kitchen with my Amazon Alexa nearby, and certain and suddenly that piece of clothing shows up in my Amazon search engine next time I'm online. Uh, but so um, I, I could listen to you gentlemen talk all day long. How, however, we are at the top of the hour. So I'm uh, sorry, uh, at the uh, the top of our of our time. So allow me to allow each one of you very briefly, if you can, uh, ten words or less. Let's see how intelligent you can make that. Um, leave our audience with one final parting thought. So, Bill, let me start with you. Well, again, I go back to um, it's, it's creating a lot more transparency on the difference between effective and efficient. Perfect, perfect. Uh, Professor Arbayaza, yes, please. I would see. Uh, I would say, be aware of all your biases and your ethics, and the, the solution starts there. Excellent, <clears throat> Professor Fayed. I would say uh, it's important to understand limitations. It's important not to listen to a lot of the hype that's happening about AI. These are simple algorithms given by lots of data today is where they are. And therefore, we need to be very aware of what the effect of different data sets can have on the behavior of these systems. And it's important to uh, evolve towards responsible practice of AI. That's a great place to for us to finish because building awareness is what a racist and these types of panels are all about. So gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for being so gracious with your time. I appreciate it and have a fantastic rest of the conference and rest of the day. Thank you, Ed. And I, I, I put you, a suggestion in the write-up in here that we do a write-up, maybe yes. a little blog to capture some of our major ideas and some of your questions. If you guys are open to it, I can... You know, I can draft some things, work on yes. it a bit with Ricardo, and then we can put it somewhere where at least the session is documented and perhaps some people can come and watch the recording. But we can also tell the rest of the world that this this uh, very nice discussion took place. Exactly. I would yes. love that and be happy to, to promote it uh, in all of, all of the places that uh, people listen to me as well. So I love it. Great idea. Thank you. <laughs> Great, Great idea indeed. Yeah. All right. Thank you all, gentlemen. Talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great to meet you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>